In the name of the love that comes to transform us, creating, redeeming, and remaking us. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, during St. Paul's 9 a.m. Bible study session, an experienced reader of scripture from the 8 a.m. service shared an insight that he had received from a spiritual teacher some years ago. That insight is that all biblical characters in every story that we encounter in scripture have wisdom to share with us about our human condition. Now, reading to see ourselves in their story can be a, tr a tougher task, but it is a path that invites us to embrace love's desire to transform us. Now, I don't know about you, but it can be tempting to brush off certain characters. I don't really want to take them seriously, no matter how much the narrative dares me to. Haman is undoubtedly one such individual deeply flawed, the clear villain in the book of Esther. The passage that Beth read for us this morning is the only time in our three-year cycle of readings on Sundays that gives us any bit of this interesting book of the Bible that speaks to the experiences of God's people as they were living in exile, having been out of the promised land taken captive by the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the Medes and Persians, the, the capital of Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire that we encounter in today's story. So it was kind of took me by surprise that this week I found myself opening up a little bit, having at least a tiny shred of curiosity about the wisdom that might be here for me, for us, in Haman's witness showing us what he does about our human condition. Because I don't think Haman is just some fall guy that's been put there to be knocked down by the divine power that delivers God's people from their antagonists. Haman serves a deeper purpose in the story, and I think his presence invites us to examine our own capacity to exercise personal freedom in ways that either deepen or diminish human flourishing. So this rare morning opportunity that we have is one that I hope we will embrace as we examine our own aspirations to live with moral courage in a world that at best can be unpredictable and at times downright dangerous. So we encounter the experience of Esther and Mordecai, these two who were clearly model citizens surviving in a foreign land, retaining their spiritual and cultural heritage in sometimes quieter ways than they maybe would have rathered. Esther comes to be part of King Ahasuerus's court when he holds a beauty contest to replace his former queen, whom he cast off for insubordination. Now, Esther keeps her heritage hidden. We don't hear this part of the story, but I'm giving you a little backdrop so that we can, we can kind of dig into this a bit more, enjoying the substance of the story. So Esther's kind of quiet about her Jewish identity, but Uncle Mordecai makes no secret. He is there serving as an advisor to the king, and he has his own values and convictions. And one is that he's not going to bow down before any human being, not Haman the Agagite, a rising star in the Persian court, or any other person, because it's not a matter of pride. It's a matter of idolatry. You shall have no other god before me. And bending the knee was a symbol of bowing to that person, to the divine. And so while Mordecai isn't buying in, isn't embracing what the king has laid forth as Haman's exemplary leadership above royal officials, Mordecai is there, true to his internal compass. Haman has his own orientation in the story too, and instead of using this leadership entrusted to him to celebrate the gifts and the strengths of his fellow colleagues, 
he chooses to wield personal power to bring others to their knees, literally. And I think it's important for us to recall that we human beings, when we succumb to our fears, our anxieties, our insecurities, this kind of behavior isn't far from any of us. Fear, after all, leads us to pledge our allegiance to competition and violence as suitable pathways to security in a world with scarce resources. Fear threatens our trust. We don't really know if there's going to be enough for all of us to flourish together. Fear presses us to take up those anxious patterns of control that so easily lead to abuse of our agency and power. We might not find ourselves at the top of the heap like Haman. If any of you know Yertle the Turtle, that Dr. Seuss story, I kind of picture Haman, right? He's a, at the top of the pile and is just about to slide off into that pond of Salamisand. And even if we're not in that kind of position of precarity, we still are faced with similar choices. Choices Haman ultimately did not embrace to cultivate trust in ourselves and in the gifts we bring to the table and trust with one another as we look to deepen the flourishing in human community. This week, I had an invitation to work on building this kind of trust with clergy in our diocese who gathered at Bishop's Ranch for our annual conference with a bishop. The facilitator of the strategic listening sessions that have been taking place all around our diocese, most recently in Foster City at St. Ambrose, this particular facilitator joined us for this time together with Bishop Austin, his first conference with, with us in his new role as our diocesan bishop. And as we dug into the conversation in our first session that initial night, Dr. Nancy Weens, the facilitator, invited us to think a little bit about our own habits of either building and deepening trust or choosing to behave in ways that erode trust. Two of the habits that she described show up in Haman's choices. And he doesn't, as far as I can see, choose to turn toward trust through his actions. He falls prey to what Dr. Weens called enemy image. Now, I know in church we often talk about the imago dei, the, the image and spark of the divine that is entrusted into each and every one of us. And we try to turn toward that and see that and appreciate that and nurture that in the littlest among us to the most wise among us. That's part of our call as people who believe that God dwells in us, right? But there's often times where we also slip in to this habit of losing touch with that divine image or at least the lens of viewing one another in that light and our culture is pretty good at stirring up our suspicions and causing us to look through a lens that might see the other as enemy. When we do this, we turn away from God's life that exists within and among us, and we can easily project onto that other individual undesirable traits that make it easy to scapegoat him or her placing all our fear and loathing outside ourselves. Somebody else's life and choices and behaviors become a threat to my existence and well-being, and you bet I'm going to do everything I can to neutralize that threat. Even when it causes me to justify solutions that are downright diabolical, yes, the clergy were exploring some histories and stories and experiences where there was some hurt in our life together in the body of Christ. And there's clearly some of that pain that's operative in the book of Esther. Whenever we cultivate 
that lack of trust, that suspicion of our enemy, we pull the plug on the potential for true community. We cut ourselves off from the goodness that flows in this life that God generously shares with us and with all creation. It kind of makes me think of that hyperbolic phrase that I know we sometimes jokingly say with maybe an Al Pacino-like accent, you're dead to me. I mean, it's funny, but also it kind of does point to this deeper wish to witness that person's demise, right? I mean, maybe I'm not going to personally lay a hand on them, but I wouldn't mind seeing them get their just desserts. That orientation isn't just harmful to the one that I am othering. It actually allows the poison of jealousy and anger and resentment to take up residence in my soul. I think that's what Haman was struggling with because Mordecai's refusal to bend the knee really does kick off this diabolical revenge. Haman isn't just interested in taking it up with the one who's offended him. He's now got a vendetta against all Jews in Ahasuerus' kingdom. I think in this time in which we live, it's important to recognize how this story holds up a mirror to our world. Anti-Semitism has never been shy about leveraging common enemy intimacy. That was another one of the concepts that we explored in our conference this week. You know, when you kind of sidle up to somebody and test the waters to see if the person that really irks you also bugs that guy too. It can be nice to kind of find people that resonate with the things that are bees in your bonnet, right? Common enemy intimacy is everywhere in our world, and it destroys trust, whether we look at the community that exists in virtual spaces, or the nightly news, and the ways that it cultivates our lens on the world, or even the garden variety gossip that pops up in everyday conversation. Yes, common enemy intimacy surely can forge some powerful bonds among us. I mean, who hasn't heard of that old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? And I think it's important to also acknowledge that this kind of behavior can show up in church too. Maybe more than we'd like to admit, and definitely with greater destructive power than we might recognize. Yeah, fear, it's funny, isn't it? Causing us to amplify pain, things we hold deep down inside, trying to get it out and make other people pay the price out of our human frustration. When I watch Haman magnifying cruelty at a scale that's impossible for just one person to pull off alone, I think he is fully possessed of that charge that comes whenever we find ourselves gunning for common enemy intimacy. I mean, after all, he recruits the king to his team and he's savvy, you know, he sees the economic objections that might arise. I mean, if you kill off all these subjects, where is that tax revenue going to get replenished? He's got a plan for that, too. Haman goes ahead and makes that forward payment to the king's treasury, and the next thing you know, the signet ring is coming out, and they're sealing the deal. But that's still not enough. Haman is still stewing about Mordecai when that invitation to come and dine with the king and queen come to him. He's nursing that grudge, and he doubles down, involving his wife and his friends in the project. They suggest, why don't you commission a gallows? You could build it out on your own front lawn and then get the king to hang Mordecai. That'll teach people a lesson. So Haman's on his way to go talk to the king about that very thing, and he walks in the room. Mordecai's name 
had just been spoken in the daily records review. An advisor who had thwarted an assassination plot against the king, but never really got recognized for his loyalty. The very man Haman wants hanged is about to be commended. And Haman doesn't catch on to the king's question. He thinks, well, who could the king want to honor more than me? So when the king asks, how would you recognize and promote someone that you're pleased with? The king says, I like your idea, Haman. Go ahead, carry it out. Mordecai's the guy, take him out in the public square and proclaim his name, put a royal robe on him, ride him around on my horse, let people know this is a loyal subject to the king. And Haman fumes. Which is so funny. I mean, the story is falling over itself to remind us that life gives us so many opportunities to see our own stumbling blocks, to wonder about what part of us is being invited to be transformed. And yet Haman doesn't appreciate the irony of the situation. He doesn't want to acknowledge what he has been nursing in his heart. And he sure isn't turning toward Mordecai, at least not on purpose. But isn't the circumstance interesting? I mean, this potential invitation to grow closer, to actually see the person he believes is his enemy as a human being, made in the image of God, someone with whom he might actually have some unfinished business. And I'm not talking about murder. What about repentance and amends making? In the end, that's kind of what the story tees up. Haman is mad that Mordecai won't bow to him, and in the end, Haman has to bend his knee. I mean, sometimes God makes it obvious, doesn't it? Life bringing us those opportunities to see the wounds that we need to have transformed, the ones that are buried deep in our hearts. Last night, Several of us from St. Paul's joined friends from the Peninsula Multiface Solidarity Cohort for a learning session and a worship service, the Slichot service, as it, is, as it is called, at Peninsula Temple Beth El, with a whole variety of Jewish congregations from around the area. I had never before experienced this particular liturgy. I've mostly been in synagogues during the festival of Purim, where we actually read the story of Esther, and we make fun of Haman, <laughs> the fall guy. So this liturgy last night had this really interesting invitation. It's sort of their parallel season to our Lent, where penitential prayers and songs tee up this space for earnest reflection and preparation for the Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah, that begins the days of awe, the season in which our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith focus on repentance, atonement, and forgiveness. Those themes that I believe are <laughs> staring us right in the face in this story of Haman. And sitting there last night in sacred space, listening to the sounds of the shofar, that funny ram's horn that they blow in. There were different rhythms, different lengths. This young man was playing it in this beautiful way, and I was struck by everything that had been in my heart and soul this week as I was with his colleagues earlier and thinking about what has been unfolding in our world and the deep pain of our human family. And I relished the message of the cantor's prayer as she sang out in Hebrew. But the words were, May God, who separates year from year, bless us with power to distinguish holy from profane, truth from falsehood, the pursuit of love from that of selfishness. I heard it as a prayer of trust, 
inviting the Holy Spirit to awaken our hearts to the wisdom that is hidden in plain sight everywhere around us in these sacred stories and in these holy traditions that invite us to be transformed as people who are being broken open by love. As we go into this week, carrying all those that we pray for, all those who are in our hearts, knowing their struggles and their pains, and the deep need of our world to be transformed, may we too make space for love to redeem and remake us now and in all the days to come. Amen.